Part 3 Creativity I don't do drugs. I am drugs. Salvador Dali 15. The Creative Advantage If your interest is high achievement, creativity matters. That's the place to start. Back in 2002, the Partnership for 21st Century Learning, a nonprofit educational coalition that included everyone from executives at Apple, Cisco, and Microsoft, to experts from the National Education Association and the U.S. Department of Education, was charged with determining which skills our children need to thrive in the 21st century. The old answer, of course, was the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. The new answer? The four C's, creativity, critical thinking, collaboration, and cooperation. We see similar results in business. Back in 2010, researchers at IBM decided they wanted a better understanding of the skills required to run a company. To get their answer, they asked over 1,500 corporate leaders in 60 different countries and 33 different industries about the quality most important in a CEO. Once again, creativity came in first. Perhaps the best data comes from Adobe's State of Create, a 2016 comprehensive survey of over 5,000 adults in the United States, United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, and France. Instead of focusing on a single industry, Adobe asked a more general question. How critical is creativity to society? Pretty damn critical, is what they discovered. Across the boards, Adobe found that creatives are significantly more fulfilled, motivated, and successful than non-creatives. On average, they out-earn non-creatives by 13%. Companies that invest in creativity, meanwhile, surpass their rivals in revenue growth, market share, competitive leadership, and customer satisfaction. That is, nearly every critical category. And when it comes to quality of life, creatives report being a staggering 34% happier than non-creatives. Among many other things, this should definitely make us rethink how we deal with depression. Finally, when it comes to stalking the impossible, creativity plays an even more important role. When chasing down big dreams, there's rarely a straight line between where we are now and where we want to go. The fact is, the bigger the dream, the less visible the path. Which is to say, in the infinite game of peak performance, motivation gets you into the game, learning allows you to continue to play, but creativity is how you steer. Which brings us to our next question. What the hell is creativity? Creativity Decoded, Part 1 Scientists have been trying to answer this question for quite some time, mainly because it took quite some time for scientists to realize it was even a question. Many ancient cultures, including the Greeks, Indians, and Chinese, lacked a word for this particular skill. They thought of creativity as discovery, because ideas came from the gods and were merely discovered by mortals. This shifted during the Renaissance, when insights bestowed by the divine became ideas kindled in the minds of great people. During the 18th century, we put a name around this kindling of ideas, developing the concept of imagination, or the process of bringing to mind things without any input from our senses. Then, at the turn of the 20th century, French polymath Henri Poincaré expanded that concept into a process. Fascinated by how his mind solved difficult mathematical problems, Poincaré realized that insights didn't arrive out of nowhere. Rather, they followed a reliable five-stage cycle. A few years later, Graham Wallace, a professor at the London School of Economics, took a harder look at Poincaré's cycle. He decided that two of the stages could be condensed into one, and he published the results in his classic book, The Art of Thought. 
The cycle, according to Wallace and Poincaré, begins with a period of preparation. Here, a problem is identified, and the mind starts to explore its dimensions. This leads to the second stage, incubation, where the problem gets passed from the conscious mind to the unconscious mind, and the pattern recognition system begins to chew on the problem. The third step is illumination, where an idea bursts back into consciousness, often through the experience we call insight. The cycle closes with a period of verification, where this new idea is consciously reviewed, tested, and applied to real-world problems. In 1927, the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead gave this cycle a name, creativity, which became a household word in 1948 when advertising executive Alex Osborne published his national bestseller, Your Creative Power. The scientific sea change began two years later, when psychologist J.P. Guilford delivered his presidential address to the American Psychological Association and pointed out that researchers had completely ignored an idea, creativity, that was now, thanks to Osborne, widespread in culture. He then set out to change that fact. Prior to this work, Guilford had helped pioneer the field of intelligence testing, IQ. Along the way, he'd noticed that certain people, creatives, often scored lower on IQ tests, not because they couldn't solve the problems on his tests, but rather because their approach to those problems generated multiple solutions. Guilford coined a term for this process, divergent thinking. It's an anti-systematic approach to problem-solving, open-ended, definitely not logical, and this was the issue. IQ tests had been designed to measure its opposite, convergent thinking, where we converge on an idea, proceeding by logical steps, narrowing our possibilities as we go. Yet Guilford also realized that divergent thinking wasn't entirely freewheeling. It had four core characteristics. Fluency. The ability to produce a great number of ideas in a short time frame. Flexibility the ability to approach a problem from multiple angles. Originality, the ability to produce novel ideas. Elaboration, the ability to organize those ideas and execute on them. These characteristics were a major breakthrough. They made creativity, an idea so weird that the ancient Greeks didn't even have a word for it, into a quality that was measurable. You could put people into a lab and give them problems to solve and count how many ideas they produced. You could compare and contrast their answers, seeing which notions showed up all over the place and which were shockingly original. This work gave us both a measurement tool and the rudiments of what has since become the accepted definition of creativity, the process of developing original ideas that have value. More progress on this process arose in the 1960s. Research into split-brain patients, people whose corpus callosum had been severed in an attempt to treat severe epilepsy, revealed functional differences in the hemispheres. Language and logic seemed to live on the left. The right was symbolic and spatial. It was the final piece in the puzzle. We had our answer. Creativity is a process. Poincaré's four-stage cycle, which relies on Guilford's four characteristics of divergent thinking, are in turn capacities housed on the right side of the brain. Creativity decoded, or at least for a while. Unfortunately, as we have since discovered, almost no part of this story is true, or not exactly and this leaves us in a peculiar place. The research tells us that creativity is foundational to high achievement and high performance, yet the research can't tell us what creativity actually is, which is about the time the neuroscientists showed up at our party. Creativity Decoded, Part 2 The one thing neuroscientists have learned since. Creativity isn't one thing. 
This is why those old myths no longer hold. Poincaré's cycle of creativity, for instance, is often the way things work, but not always. Sometimes you skip steps. Frequently you compress timescales. Meanwhile, Guilford's four characteristics of divergent thinking have held up, but they've been endlessly subdivided, relabeled, and reorganized. And the idea that the right brain is creative and the left logical doesn't come close. It takes the whole brain to be creative, and there's zero data showing that you can't be creatively logical or logically creative. Yet this doesn't mean we're nowhere. Actually, thanks to ongoing advances in brain imaging technology, we're farther along than ever before. But before we unpack what we've learned, let's start with a more basic question. What do brains do? Brains turn information into action. They gather information, both via the senses and from our own internal processes, i.e. thoughts and feelings, then turn it into action via the muscles, preferably as energy efficiently as possible. This also explains a little bit about basic brain structure. Information from our senses and those internal sources represents the brain's input stream, while motor actions represent the output stream. Most animals have limited options for actions because they have small brains. It's a real estate problem. There's just not enough neurological real estate between sensory inputs and motor outputs, so the circuit is extremely tight. This is why we use terms like instinct or reflexive behavior. It's why zebras in Africa today behave pretty much like zebras in Africa have always behaved. But the same is definitely not true for humans. Why? Because human brains are different. Our cerebral cortex grew much bigger than it did in most animals. This gives us twin advantages. First, this extra real estate puts distance between sensory inputs and motor outputs. That added brain space means we don't always have to run on automatic pilot. We have options. We can make choices. We can use this upper portion of the brain to repress our instinctive behavior, gather more data, consider possibilities, choose to act, choose to wait, choose to dance the fandango. In short, we get to pick from a much wider variety of action plans. Second, the forward portion of the cortex, our prefrontal cortex, can run simulations. This part of the brain allows us to time travel and experiment with other possible futures and other possible pasts. It can ask, what if? What might be? What could have been? Creativity, then, from the perspective of brain structure, is always about options. That's one reason it has proved so stubbornly difficult to understand. It's an invisible skill hidden inside our oldest skill the exploration and execution of action plans. If our explorations produce the same old action plans, we're being instinctive, a.k.a. efficient, but not creative. If we're producing completely novel action plans, we're creative, but perhaps not efficient. But if we're producing novel action plans that are also efficient, a.k.a. useful and valuable, we've arrived at the now-standard psychological definition of creativity, the production of novel ideas that have value, yet on sounder neurological footing. Even better, we've gained insights into how the brain produces these valuable ideas. In simple terms, we've learned that creativity is always a recombinatory process. It's what happens when the brain takes in novel bits of data combines it with older information, and uses the results to produce something startlingly new. We've also discovered that this recombinatory process typically requires the interaction of three overlapping neural networks, attention, imagination, and salience. And if we can understand how these three networks function, we can begin to think about augmenting their effects, which means we can start training up creativity which is, after all, the point. The Attention Network 
If creativity starts when the brain takes in novel information, then what do we need to take in that information? The answer is attention. As psychologist William James famously explained, millions of items are presented to my senses which never properly enter my experience. Why? Because they have no interest to me. My experience is what I agree to attend to. Only those items which I notice shape my mind. Without selective interest, experience is an utter chaos. The executive attention system governs James's process of selective interest, or what's sometimes called spotlight attention. This is the go-to network for intense concentration, for the laser focus that allows us to make choices. We can choose what to zero in on and what to ignore. When you're writing an essay or listening to a lecture or kicking a ball, this network keeps your mind on target. Neurobiologically, this network comprises the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the orbitofrontal cortex, the anterior cingulate cortex, the parietal cortex, and the subthalamic nucleus. While these names may mean nothing to you, if we tack on their functions, a clearer picture starts to emerge. The story begins in the subthalamic nucleus. Information comes in via the senses and gets routed via the thalamus to this location. Here, neurons have two main jobs. First, they help regulate instinctive behaviors. Second, this area also provides the spotlight in spotlight attention, only not in the way you'd suspect. Rather than highlighting the thing you want to pay attention to, the subthalamic nucleus dims everything else, essentially removing all possible distractions. Imagine a hundred dancers crowded onto a well-lit stage. In this situation, it's hard to know where to put your focus. But turn down the stage lights completely, place a spotlight on a single dancer, and problem solved. Attention now has no choice but to stay locked on target. This is exactly how the subthalamic nucleus works. From there, the data goes to both the anterior cingulate cortex and the parietal cortex. The anterior cingulate handles error correction. If that incoming information doesn't match a prediction the brain has already made, this is the part of the brain that notices. For example, say you're reaching for a doorknob. You think the door is unlocked, but it's actually not. The moment your hand encounters resistance, the knob won't turn, this part of the brain lights up. It means your reality isn't matching your prediction, and you might want to make other, possibly more creative, plans for getting out of that room. When it comes to executive attention, the parietal lobe has three functions. It helps our eyes stay locked on the target, allows goals to be integrated with attention, and, to help us meet those goals, allows novel action plans to be executed. In other words, if you're intent on leaving the party and reaching for the doorknob and a friend calls your name, this is the portion of the brain that keeps your eyes locked on the knob and hand reaching for it. This is also the part of the brain that helps you deviate from normal behavior, meaning instead of doing what you always do, that is, staying for another beer, this time you ignore your friend and head on home. And tomorrow morning, when you wake up without a hangover, you can thank your parietal lobe. From there, information rockets up to the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and orbitofrontal cortex. We'll take them one at a time. Your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is where your working memory lives. This is short-term information parking for the brain, temporarily storing a bit of data while we gather additional information and consider what to do next. The orbitofrontal cortex, meanwhile, helps us make decisions, primarily by doing risk assessment and social cognition. As mentioned, if you're trying to solve a difficult problem by yourself, well, that might be risky. But if you've got a bunch of friends helping you solve that problem, now it's not so dangerous. This is the part of the brain that helps make that social calculation. 
It's also a part that inhibits instinctive behavior and enables us to make more creative choices. Of course, there's more to executive attention than these five regions, and these five regions perform a lot of other functions besides the ones explored. Yet, despite being oversimplified, we now understand a bit more about how neural networks are wired and how this particular network provides the attention required for creativity. The Imagination Network The Imagination Network, to borrow psychologist Scott Barry Kaufman's moniker, or more formally the Default Mode Network, is all about spontaneous thought. This system is active when we're awake but not focused on anything in particular, which research shows is about 30% of the time. When switched on, it's the brain in daydreaming mode, simulating alternative realities and testing out creative possibilities. Neurobiologically, this system includes the medial prefrontal cortex, the medial temporal lobe, the precuneus, and the posterior cingulate cortex. And once again, if we combine structure with function, we can start to see how these parts work together to make the greater whole known as creativity. The medial prefrontal cortex is about theory of mind, or our ability to think about what others are thinking about, and creative self-expression. If you're telling a joke to a friend, and suddenly your friend starts crying, the medial prefrontal cortex notices the crying. It also tells you to stop telling the joke and start comforting your friend. The medial temporal lobe is a memory structure, as is the precuneus, though this latter area is primarily involved in the retrieval of personal memories. Taken together in our above example, once you make the creative decision to deviate from the joke and start comforting your friend, these two structures help you scour the data banks for previous times when jokes went bad and friends started crying. Their goal is to find other information that can help you decide exactly how to comfort your friend. The precuneus takes this an extra step. Beyond memory, this area handles self-consciousness, self-related mental simulation, and random thought generation. If you're telling that joke, but suddenly imagine yourself at an amusement park shrieking on a roller coaster and feeling embarrassed in front of your date, well, blame your precuneus. Finally, the posterior cingulate cortex allows us to integrate various internal thoughts into more coherent wholes, essentially gathering all the data generated by these other brain areas into a single idea. Yet, these brain areas don't tell the full story. At the start of this breakdown, our stated goal was to figure out how these networks work together to produce novel ideas that are useful. And here's the rub. Under normal circumstances, these networks don't work together. The default mode network and the executive attention network operate in opposition. Typically, the activation of one causes the deactivation of the other. But this is not the case with creatives who can keep both systems active at once and shift back and forth between them with far more fluidity than most. This means, to return to all of our examples, creatives can start telling a joke to a friend, which requires spotlight attention. They can then notice that a friend has started crying, which is a novel signal that should serve to tighten that spotlight. Yet instead, Creatives will remember the time they shrieked on the roller coaster, which is a signal generated by the default mode network. Non-creatives would never notice and instead keep their attention on the crying friend. But creatives can shift their spotlight onto this internal signal and stay there long enough to remember that feeling of embarrassment. Suddenly, the posterior cingulate cortex snaps it all together. You realize your friend is crying because they're embarrassed, and instead of comforting them, you should apologize for that insulting joke. This information also gives us a look at the work ahead. When we're training the brain to be more creative, 
a part of what we're training is this capacity for network co-activation. Why? When both of these networks are co-activated, we can perform the three Bs, bend, break, and blend. These are the skills beneath creativity, allowing us to bend what we see, break apart what we sense, and blend it all back together in a brand new way. But there's one more part to this story, which is the network that actually controls the whole show, the one that allows us to shift back and forth between these other two networks. The salience network. Salience, as a term, refers to noticeability. Objects have physical salience because of color or intensity, which is when that shiny red Corvette catches your attention. Objects can also have emotional or personal salience, which is when that shiny Corvette reminds you of your grandfather's old car. The salience network, then, is the part of the brain that notices this noticeability. This network works like a giant information filter, monitoring incoming data and tagging it as important or irrelevant. And it monitors both the external world and our internal world, which is part of the reason the salience network is so critical for creativity. Our internal world is murky. The signals aren't always clear. The thoughts and emotions that bubble up are generally subtle and often in conflict with more attention-grabbing inputs from the external world. The salience network is what alerts you to the fact that the idea that just bubbled up is a good one and worth your attention. More critically, to provide that attention, the salience network is what controls our ability to shift back and forth between the default mode network and the executive attention network. It's the master switch, making it the gateway to heightened creativity. To understand how the salience network works, we need to unpack a few more brain regions, starting with the anterior insula and the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. We'll take them one at a time. The insula plays an important role in self-awareness. It takes signals from your body, including everything from your energy level to your emotional state, blends them with key features of the environment, and then uses the most important results to make decisions. Say you're climbing a ladder and the next step feels loose. The insula is the part of the brain that starts the process of turning that feeling into the decision not to climb that ladder. The dorsal anterior cingulate cortex is the upper half of the anterior cingulate cortex. This is the region responsible for error correction, the one that lights up when the door, which was supposed to be open, is actually locked. The upper portion handles cognitive errors, and the lower portion deals with emotional errors. In total, when you noticed the feeling of that loose ladder step, the insula used that looseness to catch your attention, while the anterior cingulate turned that salience into an error signal. Don't take that step. Something's wobbly in Denmark. Finally, while the insula and anterior cingulate cortex are considered the anchor points for the salience network, equally critical are an additional trio of structures, the amygdala, ventral striatum, and ventral tegmental area. The amygdala is about threat detection. It's the part of the brain that notices anything new and novel, although it's especially sensitive to new and novel dangers. The ventral striatum and the ventral tegmental area, meanwhile, are both involved in motivation and rewards. These regions drive behavior, reinforce behavior, and generally provide a ton of feel-good neurochemicals to accomplish these tasks. In the brains of creatives, all of these areas function differently than in other people. It comes down to repetition suppression, which is the automatic suppression of familiar stimuli. When you moved to San Francisco and first saw the twists and turns of Lombard Street, your brain produced a huge response. But that response got smaller the second time you saw those twists, and even smaller the third. By the fourth, there was barely any reaction at all. 
This is when Lombard Street becomes just another blur in the background as you walk toward the corner store. And this is repetition suppression. But creative brains don't have this tendency. Their repetition suppression reflex isn't on the job. What this translates to in the real world is the ability to notice the new in the old. What does all this mean? It means, if your interest is in training up creativity, then you need to train up all three networks, salience, default mode, and executive attention. For optimal creativity, as Scott Barry Kaufman, a Columbia University psychologist and creativity expert, wrote in The Atlantic, you want multiple brain networks to be firing on all cylinders, flexibly ready to engage and disengage depending on the stage of the creative process. So how to get those networks to fire on all cylinders? That's exactly where we're headed next. 16. Hacking Creativity The term hacking has a bad name. It comes out of coding and refers to someone trying to gain control over a computer system, typically for nefarious purposes. The word then morphed a bit, becoming pop culture shorthand for a quick fix or a shortcut. None of those definitions apply here. First, the system we're trying to gain control over is our own neurobiology. Second, when it comes to sustained peak performance, there are no shortcuts. Instead, when I use a term like hacking to describe an approach to peak performance, what I'm really saying is figuring out how to get your neurobiology to work for you rather than against you. This has been our approach to high achievement since we started this book, and it's once again our approach here when we turn our attention to ways to increase creativity. Seven ways, to be exact. Over the rest of this chapter, we're going to take all the science we just learned and apply it to the problem of creativity. We'll identify seven strategies for amping up our ability to produce novel and useful ideas, exploring how these tactics work in the brain, and seeing how we can apply them in our lives. 1. Befriend your ACC When researchers talk about creativity, one of the most frequent topics of conversation in the phenomena is known as insight. This is the experience of sudden comprehension, that aha moment when we get a joke, solve a puzzle, or resolve an ambiguous situation. Yet while long recognized as core to the mystery of creativity, for much of the 20th century, insight was a black box. This changed at the turn of the 21st century when Northwestern neuroscientist Mark Beeman and Drexel University cognitive psychologist John Cunios found a way to shed some light on the subject. Beeman and Cunios gave people a series of remote association problems, a.k.a. insight problems, then used both EEG and fMRI to monitor their brains as they tried to solve them. Remote association problems are word puzzles. Subjects are given three words, pine, crab, sauce, and one goal. Find a fourth word that complements each. In this case, the answer is apple, as in pineapple, crab apple, and applesauce. Some people solve this problem logically by simply testing one word after another. Others come at it via insight, meaning that the right answer simply pops into mind. A handful of folks blend both strategies. What Beeman and Cunios uncovered was a noticeable shift in brain function. Right before people viewed a problem they would eventually solve with insight, there was heightened activity in the anterior cingulate cortex, or ACC. As we've already seen, the ACC plays a role in both salience and executive attention, and is the part that handles error correction by detecting conflicting signals in the brain. This includes alternative strategies for solving a problem, explains Cunios. The brain can't use two different strategies at the same time. 
Some are strongly activated because they're the most obvious, and some are weak and only remotely associated to the problem. Odd thoughts, long-shot ideas. These ideas are the creative ones. When the ACC is activated, it can detect these non-obvious, weakly activated ideas and signal the brain to switch attention to them. That's an aha moment. What Beeman and Cunos discovered is that the ACC lights up when we are considering those off-the-wall ideas. This is the default mode network hunting for possibilities and the salience network monitoring default mode activity, always ready to light up should this network find anything interesting. However, the ACC also governs the final step. Should we find anything interesting, the ACC switches off the default mode network and switches on the executive attention network. It's what allows us to begin that process of consideration. Which raises a key question. What lights up the ACC? The answer? A good mood. When we're in a good mood, the ACC is more sensitive to odd thoughts and strange hunches. Put differently, if an active ACC is the ready condition for insight, then a good mood is the ready condition for an active ACC. The opposite is also true. While a good mood increases creativity, a bad mood amplifies analytical thought. When we're scared, the brain limits our options to the tried and true. It's the logical, the obvious, the sure thing we know will work. When we're in a good mood, it's the opposite. We feel safe and secure. We're able to give the ACC more time to pay attention to weak signals. We're also more willing to take risks. This matters. Creativity is always a little dangerous. New ideas generate problems. They can be flat-out wrong, tricky to implement, and threatening to the establishment. But this also means we pay a double penalty for negativity. A bad mood not only limits the ACC's ability to detect those weaker signals, it also limits our willingness to act on the signals we do detect. And while a good mood is the starting point for heightened creativity, we've already started down that road. A daily gratitude practice, a daily mindfulness practice, regular exercise, and a good night's rest, that is, four activities introduced in the motivation section, remain the best recipe anyone has yet found for increasing happiness. As each of these practices plays an additional role in stimulating creativity, beyond the amplification you get from the good mood, they're all great ways to solve multiple problems at once. This also matters. Peak performers are too busy to solve problems one at a time. They're always looking for multi-tool solutions. All four of these practices are multi-tool creativity boosters that supercharge our abilities to turn the novel into the useful. Gratitude trains the brain to focus on the positive, altering its normally negatively biased information filtering tendencies. This impacts mood, but it also increases novelty. Since we're used to the negative, the positive is often refreshingly different. Since novel information is the starting point for creativity's recombinatory process, gratitude feeds the salience network more raw material. Then the good mood that results gives the default mode network a better shot at using that material to make something startlingly new. Mindfulness teaches the brain to be calm, focused, and non-reactive, essentially amplifying executive attention. But it also puts a little space between thought and feeling, and thus gives the ACC more time to consider those alternative, far-flung possibilities. More important, what kind of mindfulness training you're using matters here. Focus-based practices, such as following your breath or repeating a mantra, are fantastic for convergent thinking. But divergent thinking, which often underpins those far-flung connections, requires an open-monitoring style of meditation.
in open monitoring, instead of trying to ignore thoughts and feelings, allow them in, just without judgment. You're teaching the salience network to monitor the ideas being generated by the default mode network, but without the normal negativity that often comes from monitoring that stream of consciousness. Exercise, meanwhile, lowers stress levels, flushing cortisol from our system, while increasing feel-good neurochemicals, including serotonin, norepinephrine, endorphins, and dopamine. This lowers anxiety, augments our good mood, and amps up the ACC's ability to detect more remote possibilities. Plus, the timeout from normal life that exercise provides works as an incubation period, the second stage of Poincaré's creative cycle. Finally, a good night's rest provides additional benefits. It increases energy levels, providing more resources to meet life's challenges. The resulting feeling of safety lifts our mood and increases our willingness to take risks, and both amplify creativity. Moreover, sleep is the most critical incubation period of all. When we sleep, the brain has time to find all sorts of hidden connections between ideas. It's why there are so many tales of middle-of-the-night eureka moments. This is also why gratitude, mindfulness, exercise, and sleep are non-negotiables for sustained peak performance. The non-negotiable part is key. When life gets complicated, these four practices are typically what we remove from our schedule. But the research shows this is the last choice we should make. When life gets complicated, lean into these practices, as they're how you get the creativity needed to untangle the complicated. 2. Broaden your horizons At the beginning of this chapter, we talked about the older idea of a right-brain-left-brain -brain divide, with creativity living on the right and logic on the left. While we have since learned that you need both sides of your brain to be creative, we also know that there are real and critical differences between the hemispheres, and those differences matter for creativity. One of the largest differences is parts versus wholes. The left side of the brain is detail-oriented, while the right side wants to understand the bigger picture. The left side sees the trees, the right side notices the forest. And if our interest is in training up creativity, then we need to learn to use the right side of the brain to take in that bigger picture. This is another reason that mood matters. In times of crisis, we focus on the details. We want to know if there's problem-solving data available right here and right now. We get analytical and logical and would prefer a simple action plan with a high chance of success. When we're relaxed, the system moves in the other direction. Perspective expands. We're more likely to start thinking about the broader context and more likely to engage the right side of the brain as a result. But this doesn't mean that a good mood is the only way to get the brain to start considering that bigger picture. It turns out broad vistas also broaden attention. When you see into the distance literally, you see into the distance figuratively. That's why time in nature is so tightly coupled to creative insights. That time acts as an incubation period, and nature tells the ACC to start considering farther-flung possibilities. And since nature also has significant mood-boosting effects, this further amplifies the ACC's ability to find those far-flung connections and further enhances creativity. Along similar lines, being in small, cramped spaces has the opposite effect. It shrinks attention, getting us to focus on the parts and not the whole. So in practical terms, crawl out from under your desk, go outside, look around, repeat as needed. 3. The Importance of Non-Time and No One Non-time is my term for it. That vast stretch of emptiness between 4 a.m. when I start my morning writing session 
and 7.30 a.m. when the rest of the world wakes up. This is non-time, a pitch blackness that belongs to no one. It's not close to morning, so the day's pressing concerns have yet to press. There's time for that ultimate luxury, patience. If a sentence takes two hours to get right, who cares? This is non-time. If I have to write five paragraphs, throw them out, and write five more, well, there are no clocks in non-time. And creativity needs this non-time. Deadlines can often be stressors. When we're battling the clock crunch, the pressure forces the brain to focus on the details, activating the left hemisphere and blocking out that bigger picture. Worse, when pressed, we're often stressed. We're often unhappy about the hurry, which sours our mood and further tightens our focus. Being time-strapped, then, is frequently kryptonite for creativity. Yet, peak performers don't like downtime. It's the reason recovery is considered a grit skill. It's also the reason we need to build time for non-time into our schedules. Non-time is time for daydreaming and psychological distancing. Daydreaming switches on the default mode network. If the goal is to enable our subconscious to find remote associations between ideas, then we need this network engaged. We also need a little distance from our problems, which is another reason non-time is so crucial. This distance allows us to see things from multiple perspectives, to consider another's point of view. But if we don't have the time to get that psychological distance, to get space from our emotions and take a break from the world, then we won't have the luxury of patience or the uplift of alternative possibilities. And it's not just non-time. It's also no one. Solitude matters. Certainly a great deal of creativity requires collaboration. But the incubation phase demands the opposite. Taking a break from the sensory bombardment of the world gives your brain even more reason to wander into far-flung corners. A 2012 study run by psychologists at the University of Utah, for example, found that after four days alone in nature, subjects scored 50% better on standard tests of creativity. This is another reason to wall away distraction and start your day with 90 to 120 minutes of uninterrupted concentration. It's a high-flow bit of non-time, and one that pays significant long-term dividends. 4. Pattern Recognition, Search Parameters, and Three Martini Lunches It was a strange study. In January 2012, scientists from the University of Chicago showed 40 volunteers an animated movie. Half of the group just watched the film. The other half watched it while drinking vodka cranberry cocktails. Afterward, everyone was given a creative problem-solving task of an already familiar variety. Volunteers were shown three words like talk, tar, and carriage, and asked to pick a fourth that can be paired with each, baby. Before the drinking started, both groups performed just about equally on the task. Afterward, not so much. Turns out the drunkards, an exaggeration, the boozed-up volunteers drank to a blood alcohol level of 0 0.075, just below the 0 0.08 legal limit, outperformed the sober in both speed and accuracy. On average, those inebriated solved puzzles in 11.5 seconds. The sober needed 15.2 seconds. Moreover, the drunkards got nine right answers in comparison to the teetotalers' six. So, is there a moral to this story? Does creativity require a return to the days of three martini lunches? Perhaps. Or perhaps there's an easier way. First, let's consider why booze helps us solve remote association puzzles. Our brain is a pattern recognition system. In sober people, when the system goes hunting for patterns, it tends to search familiar, 
local networks. Creativity requires a more exotic approach. Instead of searching familiar territory, we need to rummage around in the brain's dusty corners, its back rooms and forgotten closets. So why does booze help? It softens our focus and broadens our attention. Inebriation works in the same way that big vistas in nature work. It tells the ACC to start hunting farther-flung ideas. It expands our search parameters, widening the size of the database searched by the pattern recognition system. Boozed-up folks are also more playful than sober ones. When playing, fear of failure goes down, risk-taking goes up. It's why people solve more word association problems after watching a funny film. Humor puts us in a good mood, which increases the brain's ability to find more remote connections. So does any of this translate into everyday experience? Well, you don't need three martini lunches if a funny video will work just as well. But there are other approaches to consider, like starting with the unfamiliar. When faced with a creative task, where you begin has a huge impact on where you end up. If you want more creativity in your life, then you need to start with an idea that does not immediately link to the stuff you already know. By starting with the unfamiliar, we're forcing the brain to expand search parameters and fire up its remote association skills. For example, if charged with writing the company newsletter, Start with the weird. Instead of, last month we hit our quarterly numbers, try, last month employees found a baby elephant in the lunchroom. The point is not that you'll end up starting the newsletter with that sentence. Most likely you'll edit it out later. Rather, it's that trying to come up with a sentence that follows the elephant line and is actually relevant to the company newsletter forces the brain to start to make unusual connections. Even better, no hangover. 5. Think inside the box. Think outside the box is how the saying goes, but we might have it backward. Learn to think inside the box. Constraints drive creativity. As jazz great Charles Mingus once explained, You can't improvise on nothing, man. You've got to improvise on something. In studies run at Ryder University on the relationship between limits and creativity, students were given eight nouns and asked to use them in a series of rhyming couplets, the kind that might show up on a greeting card. Another group was told to simply write rhyming couplets. The work was then judged for creativity by an independent panel of experts. Time and again, the participants who started with eight nouns, a predetermined limit, outperformed the others. University of North Carolina psychologist Keith Sawyer saw the same thing in his studies of improv theater ensembles. Improv actors are taught to be specific, Sawyer once said. Rather than say, look out, it's a gun, you should say, look out, it's the new ZX-23 laser kill device. Instead of asking, what's your problem, say, don't tell me you're still pissed off about that time I dropped your necklace down the toilet. The point is, limits drive creativity. The blank page is too blank to be useful. This is why, in my work, one of my cardinal rules is, always know your starts and your endings. These are limits that liberate. If I have these twin cornerstones in place, whatever goes in between, a book, an article, a speech, is simply about connecting the dots. But without these dots to connect, I can get stuck, or worse, wasting time wandering into tangential territory, which helps explain why my first novel took 11 years to complete. If creativity is required, not knowing where you're going is the fastest way to never get there. Important caveat. Many people believe that time constraints, that is, deadlines, are a limit that enables creativity. Maybe. Maybe not. Earlier we learned that feeling unpressured for time was one of the keys to fostering creativity. 
this remains true. Yet it's also true that deadlines can save creative projects from dragging on indefinitely. Just set that deadline far enough into the future to build long periods of non-time into your schedule. In other words, creative deadlines should fit inside that challenge skills sweet spot. Hard enough to make us stretch, not hard enough to make us snap. 6. Load the Pattern Recognition System Creativity requires pattern recognition. But what does pattern recognition require? Ammunition. If you're not feeding the pattern recognition system new information on a regular basis, then the brain lacks the ammunition it needs to make connections between ideas. This is why chance favors the prepared mind, though by chance, what we really mean is dopamine. So foundational is pattern recognition to our survival that the brain rewards the experience. As mentioned, whenever we link two ideas together, that is, whenever the brain recognizes a pattern, we get a little squirt of dopamine. This should be familiar to anyone who has ever done a crossword puzzle or played Sudoku. That little rush of pleasure we get when we fill in a correct answer, that's dopamine. But dopamine also tunes signal-to-noise ratios, helping us notice even more patterns. In our crossword example, after filling in that first right answer, we often fill in a second or third immediately afterward. The dopamine that showed up from that first instance of pattern recognition drives the next instance, and so forth. It's why creative ideas tend to spiral. But here, too, there are caveats. If the information we're feeding the pattern recognition system is closely related to information it connects to, a familiar pattern, then there just isn't enough novelty to produce the desired reaction. And this can be a problem in today's specialized world. While specialization is the standard path toward expertise, it's a lousy formula for pattern recognition. Expertise is a double-edged sword, explains Scott Barry Kaufman. Some is good for creativity. But if you're on the extreme edge of that curve, with too much expertise, it can block you from noticing those remote associations. The solution? Cast a wide net. Read 25 to 50 pages a day in a book that's far outside your specialty. Choose a topic that sits at the intersection of multiple curiosities, as identified in Chapter 2, when we learned the passion recipe, but one that has nothing to do with your normal work. As you're reading, give yourself time to daydream. When an idea catches your attention, pause and give your brain the chance to make a connection. Yet don't worry about making that connection. The brain does pattern recognition automatically. If you supply it with ammunition, it will find ways to make the fireworks. 7. The MacGyver Method The TV character MacGyver is an excellent problem solver. This is why Lee Zlotoff, who created the character, had to become an excellent problem solver. To write episodic TV, explains Zlotoff, I had to produce an enormous amount of creative material under very tight deadlines. There was no time to get stuck. After years of this work, Zlotov noticed that whenever he did get stuck, the answers he sought never appeared in the obvious places, like when he was sitting at his desk, plugging away at the problem. Rather, he got his answers when driving or taking a shower. It happened so frequently that whenever Zlotov got stuck, he would leave his office to drive home and take a shower. Eventually, Zlotov decided to figure out why this was happening. What he discovered is that lightly stimulating activity, like taking a shower, occupies the conscious mind, but not too much. It serves as an incubation period, allowing us to pass a problem from the conscious to the subconscious. And the subconscious is just a much better problem solver. It's far faster 
far more energy efficient, and has nearly unlimited RAM, meaning, while the conscious mind can handle about seven bits of information at once, there appears to be no limit on how many ideas the subconscious can juggle. More important, Zlotov also discovered that you can program the subconscious ahead of time. We can give the brain a problem to solve consciously, then use lightly stimulating activity to activate the subconscious, then re-engage the conscious mind on the backside of that activity to retrieve your answer. Zlotov calls it the MacGyver method. Here's how it works. Step 1. Problem Identification Write down your problem, literally. Speaking it aloud won't work. Telling a friend doesn't help. Writing, because of the relationship between tactile experience and memory, is key. Also, be as detailed as possible, but don't worry so much about connective tissue. For example, let's say that tomorrow I'm starting a new chapter in a book, but I'm stumped as to where to begin. I'd simply write, Tomorrow, I want to write a new chapter that's funny, engaging, ends with a cliffhanger, has something to do with blue whales and Mother Teresa. I want as much detail as possible, but don't need to worry about connecting those details. Why? Because pattern recognition is built into the system. If I'm clear about my goals, the rest takes place automatically as part of Step 2. Step 2. Incubation Step away from the problem for a little while. After you get the hang of this, one to four hours will do the trick. But in the beginning, aim for a half day or so, or sleep on the problem overnight. During this period, do something stimulating but not taxing. Zlotov likes to build model airplanes. Gardening, house cleaning, and shooting basketballs all work fine. Long walks as well. What doesn't work is TV. It requires too much mental processing to turn off consciousness. Also, if you choose to use exercise during your incubation period, make sure it's something light. If you exhaust yourself with a workout, it can hamper your ability to find the solution you're hunting for afterward. And if you ended up stressed out because you're tired and can't find that solution, the extra anxiety is going to further lower your ability to connect ideas and will make finding that solution even harder. Step 3. Free writing. After those hours have passed, sit back down at your notepad and start writing again. It doesn't matter what. Copy passages out of your favorite book. Pen song lyrics. Do haiku. After a short delay, usually no more than a few minutes, the answers to your problem will start trickling out. In the case of my earlier example, I would simply start with, I'm now trying to write my next chapter, but I don't really know what it's about. It sounds simple, but the results can be stunning. You'll find yourself solving creative problems with far more speed and efficiency than normal. Zlotov believes the biggest gains are emotional. I never have to worry about a problem, he says. If I get stuck, I know my subconscious can come up with answers my conscious mind literally can't dream of, and in far shorter time frames. It's totally removed anxiety from my writing process. 17. Long-Haul Creativity Ten years ago, I started investigating a critical but rarely discussed type of creativity. While most scientific research has focused on day-to-day -day creativity or the kind required to solve the problem at hand, I got curious about what it took to sustain that creativity over a multi-decade career. Long-haul creativity is how I've come to think of this topic. Long-haul creativity is a mystery piled atop a mystery. Creative careers are slippery. One-hit wonders abound, but fewer are enduring superstars. A creative career isn't about climbing the mountain, 
it's about always climbing the mountain. And this level of commitment requires not just originality, but rather that ultimate expression of originality, the consistent reinvention of self, again and again. Long-haul creativity isn't about a first act or a second act. It's a third and fourth and fifth act. It's that ultimate impossible, the infinite game, where the goal is simply to keep on playing. In the last chapter, we examined seven ways to heighten day-to-day -day creativity. In this one, we're hunting for ways to sustain that heightened creativity over a lifetime. Unfortunately, this is also where the science gets thin. Little work has been done on long-haul creativity. There are way too many confounding factors for any reasonable approach. Most researchers have simply avoided the issue. Yet this doesn't mean we're completely lost. What it does mean, at least for this chapter, is that we're going to alter our approach. Since there's no great research on the subject, I've been doing some of my own. Over the past decade, I've talked to a couple hundred peak performers, athletes, artists, scientists, scholars, architects, designers, musicians, screenwriters, and more, seeking solutions that have passed the test of time. One thing's for certain, long-haul creativity involves a slew of unusual skills, many of which conflict with our ideas about what it takes to be creative in the first place. What's more, long-haul creativity usually requires earning a living from one's creativity. Yet being creative is different from the business of being creative. And many of the people who learn how to be good at the first are often really terrible at the second. Finally, emotionally, creativity takes a toll. Decade after decade, that toll adds up. So here are nine of my favorite lessons on the hard fight of long-haul creativity. A few are my own. Most I learn from others. All are things I've applied in my career with considerable success. Yet don't assume that what works for me will work for you. Improvise as you see fit. 1. Pack your full quiver. In graduate school, I got the chance to study under novelist John Barth. Often considered the godfather of American metafiction, Barth made his career by pushing the bounds of language and inspiring a literary movement along the way. He also gave me some of the best advice I'd ever received on long-haul creativity. Context is helpful. Barth and I were discussing author Thomas Pynchon's classic, Gravity's Rainbow. For those unfamiliar, the book is a beast, over 800 pages long with over 800 different characters, and some of the most hyper-stylized language ever written. And that's what we were discussing, Pynchon's linguistic pyrotechnics and my obsession with mimicking those pyrotechnics. I, too, wanted to write super-stylized, multi-layered sentences, thick with the razzle-dazzle. Yet Barth pointed out that there was more going on. In the middle of Gravity's Rainbow, he explained, Pynchon tells two stories that are central to the book's main themes, and he tells them in very plain language. When he needed to, Pynchon ditched style for substance. You can never have too many arrows in your quiver is how Barth explained it. He meant that, over the course of any book, most authors will require fluency in a half-dozen different styles. Pynchon included everything from advertisements to song lyrics to short stories in Gravity's Rainbow. Similarly, over the course of a long career, a writer will have to be expert at a dozen different forms of communication. Advertising, marketing, Novels, nonfiction books, articles, blogs, sales letters, websites, and more. Barth was emphasizing the need to surround your craft. And for creatives, this is a hard lesson to learn. The fun of creativity is doing your thing well, 
but learning to do everybody else's thing well, that isn't nearly as exciting. But that's how you sustain a career. It's true in writing. It's true in every field. As Barth pointed out, you can never have too many arrows in your quiver. 2. The Ferris Four Earlier, Tim Ferris helped us 80-20 our approach to skill acquisition. Here he weighs in on long-haul creativity. Ferris takes a four-step approach. Four things he does on a regular basis that have helped him sustain creative momentum for years on end. Daily Exercise Ferris recommends at least an hour a day, and the reason should be already familiar. Exercise lowers anxiety levels and helps clear the head. As a consistent stress reliever, there may be no better approach. Keep a Maker Schedule The term Maker Schedule comes from a 2009 essay written by Y Combinator co-founder Paul Graham. It refers to a schedule that makes room for non-time and no one. It has large blocks of time set aside for focused concentration on one particular task. Graham contrasts this to a manager's schedule, which is the day sliced into tiny slots, each with a specific purpose, meetings, calls, emails, and so on. A manager's schedule is useful on occasion, but for sustaining creativity over time, Ferris believes a maker schedule is foundational. So carve out big swatches of time for key creative tasks. If complex problem solving or analysis is required, Ferris recommends putting aside blocks of time that are four hours long. And this means no distractions. Turn off email, phone, messages, Skype, Twitter, and all the rest. While this may not be how we typically chunk our days, on those days when we need creativity, there's no other choice in the matter. Take long walks. Without music or podcasts or distraction, purposefully let the mind wander. The walk is a mandatory incubation period. It switches off spotlight attention and switches on the default mode network, a.k.a. the imagination network, giving the brain the time it needs to hunt for remote associations between ideas. Ask the better question. Surround yourself with people who are good at spotting your assumptions. It's not just people who make me question my assumptions, Ferris explains. The people who are the very best at this are the ones who hear my question and respond with, You're asking the wrong question. The better question is, this last point is important. Feedback is critical for creativity, but your choice of a feedback giver is also critical. Everyone has blind spots. Everyone has preferences. Too much overlap between yourself and your feedback partner can defeat the purpose. But if your partner is too far from you, their feedback will never be truly applicable. It's a delicate balance. And for creatives, getting the balance right becomes far more important the more successful you get. If you make a name for yourself as a creative, people have the tendency to trust your ideas a little more than they should. Too frequently, you can find yourself being given the benefit of the doubt. This is not a winning formula. So Ferris takes a proactive approach. To get the feedback he needs, Ferris hunts for folks who help him reframe his question. Rather than just drilling into details or playing devil's advocate, reframers take the idea farther, faster. By providing a better question, they're providing a launch pad for curiosity. This puts energy back into the system, and that creates momentum. And for long-haul creativity, nothing is more important than momentum. 3. Momentum Matters Most Speaking of momentum, 
there is something deeply exhausting about the year-in and year-out requirements of imagination. Every morning, the writer faces a blank page, the painter an empty canvas, the innovator a dozen directions to go at once. The advice that has helped me solve this slog came from Nobel laureate Gabriel Garcia Marquez. In an interview he gave years ago in Playboy, of all places, Marquez said that the key to sustaining momentum was to quit working at the point you're most excited. In other words, once Marquez really starts to cook, he shuts down the stove. This seems counterintuitive. Creativity is an emergent property. Quitting when most excited, when ideas are really emerging, seems like the exact opposite of what you should do. Yet Marquez has it exactly right. Creativity isn't a single battle. It's an ongoing war. By quitting when you're excited, you're carrying momentum into the next day's work session. Momentum is the real key. When you realize that you left off someplace both exciting and familiar, someplace where you know the idea that comes next, you dive right back in, no time wasted, no time to let fear creep back into the equation, and far less time to get up to speed. And it's not just Marquez who feels this way. Ernest Hemingway advocated for the exact same idea. Hemingway, in fact, would take it to an even greater extreme, often finishing the day's writing session mid-sentence, leaving a string of words just dangling off the... 4. A few thoughts on sobbing, shouting, and punching hard objects. I've written 15 books. Two are in drawers. Thirteen are in stores. All share one thing in common. At some point during their writing, I lost my mind. Without question, at least once a book, I end up face down on the ground, sobbing, shouting, and punching the floor. I don't know how it happens. It just seems to happen. One minute I'm sitting at my desk, the next I'm completely unglued. But, of course, I'm not the only one. Nearly everyone I've spoken to about long-haul creativity has a similar story. So yes, creativity is insanely frustrating, and it's insanely frustrating for everybody. The question for long-haul creativity, what to do about it? Turns out, nothing. Frustration is a fundamental step in the creative process. Freud talked about sublimation, a defense mechanism that transforms private, often socially unacceptable frustrations, me, face down, punching the floor, into socially acceptable expressions of creativity, the book you're now listening to. The Gestalt psychologist Kurt Levin simplified things further, arguing that frustration is simply an obstruction to a goal that demands an innovative response. A considerable amount of science backs up this idea. The general thinking is that unsolved problems stick in the brain in the form of easy-to-retrieve memories. In The Eureka Factor, John Cunios and Mark Beeman explain it this way. This memory is much more than a mental note. It energizes all of your associations to the information in the problem, sensitizing you to anything in your environment that might be relevant potentially including the solution. Thus, when you encounter something that's even remotely associated to the problem, a word, a sound, a smell, it can act like a hint that triggers an insight. From a practical perspective, this means we have to invert our traditional relationship with frustration. When most people encounter this feeling, they take it as a sign that they're doing something wrong. But if frustration is a necessary step in the creative process, then we need to stop treating its arrival as a disaster. For creativity, frustration is a sign of progress, a sign that that much-needed breakthrough is a lot closer than you suspect. Or as the playwright Edward Albee once said, 
Sometimes it's necessary to go a long distance out of the way to come back a short distance correctly. 5. Sir Ken Robinson weighs in on frustration. Sir Ken Robinson has become one of our leading proponents for creativity. His TED Talk on the subject remains the most watched of all time. He's argued that creativity should be considered as critical to a child's education as literacy and numeracy. He's argued that creativity is the most important survival skill in a world of accelerating technological change. But what he's never really talked much about is what it takes to sustain that survival skill over a long career. Thus, a few years ago, at a conference in Italy, when I got a chance to sit down and talk to Robinson, one of the first things I asked about was the necessary ingredients for long-haul creativity. Frustration was his response. Long-haul creativity, Robinson believes, requires a low-level, near-constant sense of frustration. This is different from the just-discussed Moment of Madness version of frustration. Moment of Madness frustration is the kind that makes you, or at least me, punch the ground. Robinson's version is about motivation. It's a constant, itchy dissatisfaction, a deep sense of what if and can I make it better and the like. To illustrate the difference, he told me a story about the time he got to meet George Lucas. Apparently, Robinson popped the question. Hey, George, he asked, why do you keep remaking all those Star Wars movies? Lucas had a great answer. In this particular universe, I'm God, and God isn't satisfied. 6. Everybody's got a job to do. There's a mistaken assumption that creativity is a solitary pursuit. This may be somewhat true for a few steps in the process, but if your interest is in the business of creativity, that is, getting paid to have original and useful ideas, then you better get used to working with others. The business of creativity is always collaborative. Every journalist has to brave a gauntlet of editors, copy editors, and managing editors ad infinitum. Movies and books and plays and poems are more of the same. Startup entrepreneurs always have investors, while creative CEOs must navigate boards of directors. And this brings me to an important point. Everybody's got a job to do. And everybody wants to keep that job. In writing, this means that even if I turn in something perfect, my editors are still being paid to edit, and so they will. This is why I discovered it's important to try to stay ahead of this curve. These days, every time I turn in a piece of finished work, I intentionally include a few horrible paragraphs. It gives my editors something to do. It lets them feel useful. It keeps their grubby little hands away from my damn perfect sentences. 7. Someone's Always Chasing You Burke Sharpless is a screenwriter, a producer, and a member of a fairly elite club, one of the few people in Hollywood who gets to pen big-budget action flicks. Big-budget means over $100 million. It means big risk. For Burke, it took nearly two decades of incredibly hard work before anyone let him take that risk. And to sustain his creativity over that long haul, Burke believes in tapping one of the oldest motivators of all, competition. Someone's always chasing me, he says. I try to remember that. For every movie of mine that gets made, there are thousands that don't. For every one of me, there are another 5,000 screenwriters just below me, and another 10,000 just below them. It's always a competition. They all want my job. And a couple hundred of them are probably really, really good. They're just about at my level. 
They have the talent required. They just haven't made all the right connections. But they will. I find it very motivating to remember that. 8. Creativity is a byproduct. Contrary to popular opinion, creativity is almost always the byproduct of passionate hard work and not the other way around. Two time Olympian and four time X Games gold medalist Gretchen Bleiler, who is considered one of the more creative snowboarders in history, explains it like this You don't wake up and say, Today I'm going to be more creative. You do the things you love to do and try to get at their essence and allow things to emerge. It's worth unpacking Blyler's idea a little further. Doing what you love is about stacking intrinsic drivers. With frustration built into the creative process, without this stack properly assembled, there's no way to sustain that effort over the long haul. Trying to get at the essence of things means walking the path to mastery, the need to be constantly learning and improving. Allowing things to emerge is what happens if you get all of this right. To paraphrase neuroscientist Leanne Gabora, creativity is paradoxically about pulling something out of the brain that was never put into it. In this process, we are noticing options where before there were none. Yet a great many of those options only become visible in the middle of the activity. I always set out to write great sentences, but I never set out to write a great sentence. The artistry emerges from the work. It's the nature of the beast. Remote associations mean that one thing leads to the next, and the next, and the next. Thus, you can't force the issue ahead of time. All you can really do is prepare, work hard, and as Blyler says, allow things to emerge. 9. Always keep your word, especially when talking to yourself. Creative people show tendencies of thought and action that in most people are segregated, wrote psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi in his masterwork, Creativity. They contain contradictory extremes. Instead of being an individual, each of them is a multitude. What Csikszentmihalyi is getting at is the nature of the creative personality type. Every character trait can be thought of as a spectrum. Most of us are of the either-or variety, either extroverts or introverts competitive or cooperative, smart or naive. But this is not true for creatives. Creatives are often both and. Consider conservative and rebellious, two traits that seem diametrically opposed to each other. Yet creatives are often required to be both at once. A filmmaker who is making a throwback detective story is conserving the tradition of noir filmmaking that same filmmaker may choose to replace the dark, moody shots often found in this style of film with brightly lit, super-saturated colors, wherein she's rebelling against tradition. And she can obviously be both in the same film. The same can be said for introverted and extroverted. Creative businessmen might be extremely introverted when they're constructing their sales strategy for the next quarter, but extremely gregarious when out on those actual sale calls. Or fantastical and realistic. A science fiction writer has to be fantastical to write a book about life on other planets, and extremely practical when designing the marketing strategy for the launch of that same book. In total, Csikszentmihalyi identified ten both-and characteristics of creatives energetic and sedate, smart and naive, playful and disciplined, fantastical and realistic, extroverted and introverted, ambitious and selfless, conservative and rebellious, humble and proud, passionate and objective, sensitive to others, and cold as ice.
all are the byproduct of either the creative process or the neurobiological requirements of creativity. But the end result of this both andness? Frequently an emotional roller coaster. The openness and sensitivity of creative individuals often exposes them to suffering and pain, yet also to a great deal of enjoyment, continues Csikszentmihalyi. The suffering is easy to understand. The greater sensitivity can cause slights and anxieties that are not usually felt by the rest of us. Being alone at the forefront of a discipline also makes you exposed and vulnerable. It is also true that deep interest and involvement in obscure subjects often goes unrewarded or even brings on ridicule. Divergent thinking is often perceived as deviant by the majority, and so the creative person may feel isolated and misunderstood. These occupational hazards do come with the territory, so to speak, and it is difficult to see how a person could be creative and at the same time insensitive to them. And this brings us to the final bit of advice for long-haul creativity. Keep your word. First off, keep your word to other people. The roller coaster of creativity can take on the feeling of a crisis. For many, it's almost like a permission slip to misbehave. This gives creatives the reputation for being difficult to deal with in the short run and unreliable in the long. And while this may be true, it's definitely not true for people who figure out how to make a living being creative. More crucially, keep your word to yourself. Peak performance is a checklist. It's the fortitude to get up every day and complete every goal on that checklist and repeat. But once creativity starts getting into this mix and those goals become creative goals, the roller coaster can sweep us away. This is why you have to learn to keep your word to yourself. If you set a goal, you complete that goal, no matter the emotions involved. This is how you sustain creativity over the distance. After all, if you can't keep doing the work, there's going to be no haul whatsoever, never mind the long. 18. The Flow of Creativity In 1968, NASA was confused. The space agency had a lot of smart people on staff, but smart and creative were different things. NASA's lifeblood was innovation. They desperately needed their most creative engineers working their most difficult challenges. Yet telling the Picassos from the paint-by-numbers crowd, that was the problem. To help sift and sort engineers, NASA brought in creativity expert George Land. Land designed a test to measure divergent, a.k.a. nonlinear, free-flowing, outside-the-box, thinking abilities, what we now call an alternative uses test. A typical question, name as many purposes as you can for that jar of M&Ms. Typically logical, convergent thinking answers, a candy holder, pencil holder, or place to put errant coins. More divergent, less typical answers. A prison for cockroaches. A badly insulated space helmet. The test worked. Land solved the problem, and NASA loved the results. But success raised another question. Where does creativity come from in the first place? Nature or nurture? Then it dawned on them. Land had unintentionally designed a tool for answering this question as well. His test was so simple it could be given to children. In fact, it could be given again and again, tracking kids over time, seeing how nurture impacted nature along the way. With NASA's help, Land assembled a group of 1,600 four- and five-year-olds from a wide assortment of backgrounds. Everyone took the test. The results shocked everyone. 98% of the kids scored at the genius level of creativity. 
it meant that the average four-year-old could out-innovate the average NASA engineer. But that ingenuity didn't last. Land retested the kids five years later. By then, test scores had plummeted to 30%. By age 10, for reasons unclear, some 68% of their creativity had vanished. Five years later, the results were worse. Once these kids reached 15 years of age, their level of creativity had dropped to 12%. Next, Land gave the test to over a million adults. The average age was 31. Their average creativity? 2%. Land had his answer. Nature builds creatives. Nurture tears them down. Growing up, according to his research, was the number one risk factor for squelching innovation. Why? Land believes the issue is a conflict between our brain's fundamental hardwiring and our educational system. Mostly, the brain does convergent thinking with the executive attention network and divergent thinking with the default mode network. But our educational system demands that students use both systems at once, come up with novel ideas via the default mode network, judge them immediately with executive attention. This constant judgment, this endless cycle of creative criticism and doubt, in Land's opinion, is killing genius. Yet there are problems with this explanation. For starters, Land's test was designed in the 1960s, when researchers believed convergent and divergent were different cognitive styles. They're not. Divergent and convergent are not types of thinking, explains psychologist John Cunios. They are types of lab tasks. In terms of cognition, divergent thinking is convergent thinking repeated without the replacement of previously generated solutions. It's not so different. What's more, Land's issue is that schools are forcing students to use both the default mode network and the executive attention network at once. Yet the science shows that creativity requires exactly this kind of multi-network approach. By forcing students to use them both, shouldn't schools be training up this variability? But they're not. The reason? Once again, neurobiology. Executive attention lives in the prefrontal cortex, but the prefrontal cortex doesn't fully mature until the age of 25. As a result, kids have weaker executive attention skills. This means poorer impulse control over themselves, but also over their creative ideas. What's more, children's brains aren't hyper-organized. We're born with a huge amount of connectivity between neurons, but those connections decline with age. So when young brains go hunting for remote associations between ideas, there's more to find. This is the real reason divergent thinking declines over time. It's not that education kills creativity. It's that normal developmental processes get in the way. And this is where flow comes into this story. In flow, the three major brain networks that underpin the creative process all work together in an unusual way. The executive network is online, but not completely. The part that generates task-specific laser focus is hyperactive. Everything else is shut down. This means you can focus on your creative problem, but the inner critic remains silent. Concurrently, the salience network is both hyperactive and incredibly sensitive. It's tuned in to both internal signals being generated by the default mode network and external signals that demand executive attention. Lastly, the default mode network is wide awake and slightly tweaked. The anterior cingulate cortex is hyperactive. The amygdala is mostly offline meaning 
our ability to do pattern recognition and remote association is jacked up, but the brain's normal bias for negative information is down low. In other words, flow is the brain on creative overdrive. It mimics all the inventiveness that comes with being four years old. Just, you know, without the downside of having a four-year-old brain. But this does raise a final question. Where do we get more flow?